Coming up next, View TV News. The hottest local news. Trending international stories. Weekly review. Topics that affect our communities. In-depth analyses and opinions. All that you need is in one place. Weekly review. Sunday night at 9 on VIEW TV 6. We strive for reliability, objectivity and accuracy. We deliver news that is precise and free of bias. We provide critical insight into the biggest stories not just in Hong Kong, but also the rest of the world. VIEW TV News. Every night on VIEW TV 6. I'm Hailing Chan in Hong Kong and welcome to VIEW TV News. Coming up on tonight's show, a shake-up of the MTR management board in the wake of the Shatin Central Link construction scandal. A think tank suggests doubling the size of the government's proposed East Lantau Metropolis reclamation project, but at what cost? And a frantic recovery effort in Indonesia. Rescue crews on the island of Lombok deal with death and destruction. We begin tonight with developments on the building work scandal surrounding the Shatin Central Link. Secretary for Transport and Housing Frank Chan says the government has demanded that MTR sack the team responsible for the construction. Speaking at a news conference a few hours ago, Chan said drawings submitted by MTR last month didn't match the plans initially approved by the buildings department. He added that as many as 2,000 couplers were missing when compared with what MTR reported earlier this summer. There were huge public safety concerns after reports suggested steel bars of a Hong Hong station platform were cut short instead of being properly screwed into couplers. Chan lashed out at MTR for failing to explain the issue, saying the government will hire external consultants to help MTR review the project going forward. While well, MTR is also under scrutiny for how it's managing ground sinking at a number of locations. The rail company has revealed it's monitoring 64 sites for possible subsidence. That figure is much higher than the initial public expectations. District councillors and engineers have expressed their worries, saying the situation is out of control. Ahmed Lee has the story. MTL has, for the very first time, revealed a list of 64 sites it's been monitoring for subsidence. The report, which dropped late Monday night, shows monitoring sites all over the city and on different rail lines. Tin Wing Station in Tin Shui Wai along the light rail has the most serious subsidence at 9 centimetres that exceeds the facility's safety level of 8 centimetres. The construction works nearby have stopped, but the sinking remains an issue. The district councillor is warning it's out of control. Even with the construction work on hold, the sinking still continues. Even exceeding the safety level, it's dangerous. It could be life-threatening. Kowloon Station is another named on MTR's list. With 1.7 centimetres subsidence, it's close to the safety level of 2 centimetres. But the monitoring work has since wrapped up because the rail company said construction of the West Kowloon Kautro District M Plus project is now complete. One engineer, though, says he wants MTR to be more cautious. Any monitoring should happen over the long term, especially in reclaimed land. There could still be subsidence after decades, perhaps not die that much, but there remains a need to monitor for longer than a year or so. Yunlong Station was the first affected site discovered by local media back in June. That location appears on MTR's list as well. More sinking platform scares were then reviewed in later months. The government has also introduced a new mechanism where the building's department will notify MTR and the Electrical and Mechanical Service Department when it grants consent for works within railway protection areas. The move should give the rail company enough time to draft plans to monitor its operations. Now let's take a look at the city's perennial debate on land supply. Think tank Our Hong Kong Foundation today offered a new proposal on the East Lantau Metropolis development. It said the government's original plan is too conservative. 
The think tank proposed to reclaim 2,200 hectares of land in East Lantau to build a man-made island between Lantau and Hong Kong Island. The figure is double the government's goal, which is only 1,000 hectares. It estimates the island could house up to 1.1 million residents, but the foundation stopped short of estimating the project cost. This is a recommendation. We're a think tank. This is not a government um, uh, department or government uh, uh, policy level announcing, you know, what Hong Kong will do. We're just presenting what, after very heavy, intensive research, what we believe Hong Kong needs to do. Much more detailed feasibility studies will need to be conducted. Ryan Ip, a senior researcher at our Hong Kong Foundation, joins us now. Well, Ryan, our Hong Kong Foundation is proposing doubling the size of the government's suggested reclamation sure. site in East Lantau. So uh, why do you think this is necessary? Well, I think you have to first look at our backgrounds. We think that Hong Kong now is suffering from, you know, three problems. One is very unaffordable housing. Second one is, you know, the uh, very crowded living environment. Our you know, per capita you know, living space is 170 per square feet, which is 60% uh, less than Singapore and 25% less than Tokyo. The, second, uh, the third one is actually a very high population density. Our population density is actually as high as Mumbai in India. And with, these, uh, with this background, we think that uh, Hong Kong will need around 9,000 hectares of land in the next 30 years, which is uh, you know, equivalent to the size of three shanty new towns. That is also nearly double the figure of the government's estimation of you know, 4,800 hectares. And in fact, the government has, you know, has uh, also uh, admit that their estimation of 4,800 hectares is a little bit conservative. And with this background, we think that um, we need more land in Hong Kong. And the only place the only way they have that can have a more efficient land supply is to have you know large scale reclamations, and with that the government is already planned to have you know a uh, East Lantau metropolis you know around one thousand hectares, but we think that this can be the the scale of this can be uh, increased. Actually, we have studied this with you know uh, our consultant Arup and also McKinsey. We think that we can double the size of this island to you know two thousand hectares to hopefully you know, solve our uh, housing problems to decrease our population density and also increase our, you know, per capita living space. Okay, so in a press conference earlier this afternoon, your executive director seemed pretty reluctant to discuss cost, right? So how would you persuade Hong Kongers that uh, your proposal is worth the money? Sure, I think first of all, actually, we have a group to do the estimate. We, uh, they, they actually estimated that the uh, cost of the reclamation, you know, which is including the seawall, including the uh, sand field, all together is around you know a hundred uh, hundred uh, dollar Hong Kong dollar per square feet. If we have to compare this figure, actually, if you look at uh, some of the other land supply op land supply options, for example, if you have to resume farmland in the new territories, uh, the figures can go up to you know around uh, fifteen hundred. Uh, per square feet, and if we compare to that, actually uh, the cost of our, our reclamation is actually uh, uh, is actually comparable to other land supply options. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two is uh, it is very hard to secure enough land supply of this scale uh, in new territories, and with this uh, uh, ease enhanced new, uh, East Land Town Metropolis, we can secure as much as 2,200 uh, hectares of land. And I think this is a very uh, worthwhile um, a proposal to Hong Kong. And if you talk about the cost, I think you should not view that as an expense, rather you should view that as an investment for Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. If you look, at, look, look back at the 90s, we have the uh, airport project, and at that time, people also complained about the cost. And you know, if we, if today, if without this project, we will not have the uh, Hong Kong airport. We will not have the IFC. We will not have, you know, a lot of the, you know, the Dongshong New Towns and Cheng Ma Beach. A lot of this infrastructure. Mm, okay. Thank you very much. That was Ryan Ip uh, with our Hong Kong Foundation. Moving on now, the hospital authority has announced an upgrade of services at Eastern Hospital. It'll add 10 beds for oncology and 20 for accident and emergencies in the coming year. It'll also roll out a plan to ensure pharmacists remind elderly patients about regular drug refills. 
The Eastern Hospital has been renovated to expand its wards for day procedures and treatments. The number of wards will be increased to 11, which is expected to cater for more than 2,000 patient visits per month. The government's public annuity scheme is on track to meet its application's target. That's according to the chief executive of the Hong Kong Mortgage Corporation annuity, Edmund Lau. On a radio program, Lau said many applicants have opted to put in the maximum amount, amount of a million dollars. He added that the pricing and return rate of the product won't be adjusted in near future, as they were calculated based on long-term financial data. Applications for the scheme will close tomorrow. Most of the subscribers so far are aged between 65 and 75. Lau said he has no plans to lower the age limit. There are very few annuity products for people aged 65 and above. There seems to be an age gap in the market, and that's why we are trying to fill that. Hong Kong's annuity products mainly cater to younger people, and these are deferred annuities. That market is already very vibrant. So our focus would still be on senior citizens. Coming up next, the latest from the world of business. Starting with the local markets, the Hang Seng Index ended 1.5% higher at 28,248. The market was boosted by gains in property stocks after developer Country Garden said it expected good first-half results. Over in Shanghai, the composite index did really well, climbing 2.7% to close at 2,779. This is its biggest gain since May 2016, with the energy sector, industrials and basic materials all gaining more than 3%. Oil prices are on the rise today following the reintroduction of U.S. sanctions on Iran. The move is expected to tighten global oil supplies as Iran is a major crude exporter. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani has hit back at Washington, describing the penalties as psychological warfare meant to divide his country. President Donald Trump reimposed the sanctions to stop Tehran from being able to do business in U.S. dollars. The EU, China and India say they oppose these measures. Well, of course, China and the U.S. are also at loggerheads over trade. Beijing is keeping up its criticism of Washington, with state media calling Trump's belief that he's winning the trade war wishful thinking. But while the rhetoric on both sides is increasingly aggressive and businesses are caught on the back foot, some companies are cashing in on the trade war. Eve Johnson explains. Washington and Beijing's escalating trade war has companies on both sides of the Pacific struggling to deal with all the uncertainty. But one group is cashing in, consultants. International trade advisors say they're busier than ever selling their services to companies trying to navigate the confusion. Reuters' Engen Tham in Shanghai says they're doling out advice on ways to get around trade rules without breaking the law. One of the things that companies will go to consultants for is to ask them whether or not they can recode one of their products. If it's used for one purpose, it may come under a code which is subject to an increased tariff, whereas if it's under a different purpose, if it can be used for a different purpose, then it's not subject to the increased tariff. And so very often you need expert opinion to be able to help you assess that. U.S. consultancy Derringer says it's also seen a bump in demand for so-called tariff engineering. One of these strategies is called a, quote, complete breakdown. So, for example, if you are a company that is in China and you are exporting lawnmowers to the U.S. for sale, then if, for example, there is a tariff on lawnmowers in the U.S., then what you could do, you could disassemble the lawnmower in China and export the parts instead of the entire lawnmower to the U.S. and then reassemble in the U.S. Consultants are also busy advising companies on their supply chains, with some U.S. firms looking to shift from China to countries not affected by tariffs, like Thailand or Vietnam. All this means big money for U.S. firms like Mohawk Global Trade Advisors. Its consultancy business is up by 20 percent, ever since U.S. President Donald Trump helped set the tariff battle in motion. But some consultants say they're not getting complacent just yet. One warning that when it comes to Donald Trump and his policies, everything could change at the drop of a tweet. Time for a quick break, but stay with us. Up next, devastation and destruction in Indonesia's holiday paradise of Lombok after Sunday's powerful quake.
We enrage. We envy. We resent. We dislike. We breathe. We laugh. We cry. We live. We disappoint. We frustrate. We bore. We suffer. We fear. We doubt. We defeat. We empower. We communicate. We talk. We listen. We learn. We care. Jazzing up. Touching hearts. Paying attention. Seemingly distant. Deeply connected. No food. I need some food. No shelter. I have to build up my shelter. No fresh water. Here we go. I need this. No tools. This I can make use of. No camera crew. There's just not enough to gather here. There's not enough to hunt. Just one man alone in the wilderness, surviving. Survivor Man, Wednesday night at 8.30 on VIEW TV 6. Take a trip to the land down under. Behind every native animal surviving in the wild. Can we talk about this? All the furry babies living in different households. This is a massive open gash. I don't think a positioning is too bad. There's a dedicated veterinary team. That's just such a good result. Because animal lives matter. Look after my girl. Thank you so much. Bondi Vet. Friday, Saturday and Sunday night at 8 on VIEW TV 6. From raw materials to finished products. The world is a better place because of caramel. Or inspiring details. There's 700 different condiments here at Beauty and Foods. Wonderful processors. All natural ingredients that was made with hand. Get ready to witness the birth of your favorite nibbles. Food Factory, Sunday night at 7.30 on VIEW TV 6. Hard-hitting investigative reports. Newsmaker interviews. Compelling human interest stories. Life-changing reports. News magazine that draws you in. 2020. Saturday night at 9.30 on VIEW TV 6. Gripping real-life stories from all corners of the world. Transforming your one-hour TV time into an exceptional cinematic experience. Theatre 96. Sunday night at 9.30 on VIEW TV 6. Documentaries you absolutely can't miss. Welcome back. Rescuers on Indonesia's island of Lombok are still hoping to pull victims out alive from the rubble amid the rising death toll. Hundreds of tourists there, meanwhile, remain stranded. This 23-year-old woman was found alive beneath a collapsed convenience store. Rescue crews say they'd almost lost faith in finding survivors under the structure until they heard a voice. There was a moment of relief and joy after she was pulled out and taken to hospital. Scores of tourists are trying to leave the island after Sunday's strong quake. Reuters correspondent Kanupriya Kapoor has this update from the ground. So this is the kind of destruction we're seeing in the, in, in the north of Lombok where the earthquake happened a few days ago. Uh, we're about 30 minutes drive away from uh, where the epicenter was and this uh, is a village uh, where people have completely lost their homes, they've been completely flattened. Uh, uh, most residents uh, have evacuated. So people in places like these have nothing to come back to. They think uh, a lot of them rely on, uh, on the tourism sector for their livelihood. Uh, a lot of the tourists, uh, most of the tourists have fled uh, and they think it will take uh, anything between six months to a year to get back on their feet um, because of this uh, disaster. Canada says it's standing firm in its defense of human rights after a diplomatic row with Saudi Arabia. Riyadh has frozen new trade and investment deals with Ottawa and expelled the Canadian ambassador in retaliation for the government's call to free arrested Saudi civil society activists. Emily Wither has this report. 
Saudi Arabia lashing out at Canada after the country's foreign ministry urged Riyadh to release arrested civil rights activists. The kingdom has suspended new trade and investment with Canada, ordered the ambassador to leave within 24 hours and recalled its own from Ottawa. The Saudi foreign ministry saying it retained its right to take further action over Canada's, quote, interference in their internal affairs. Canada will always stand up for human rights in Canada and around the world, and women's rights are human rights. Canada singling out Sama Badawi, who was arrested a week ago. The women's rights campaigner won the International Women of Courage Award in 2012 and had been calling for an end to the kingdom's male guardianship system. She's the latest to be swept up in a government crackdown on activists, clerics and journalists. More than a dozen women's rights activists have been targeted since May. A move at odds with the progressive image the government is projecting under Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Among the easing social restrictions, women are now allowed to drive. But most of those arrested campaigned for that very right. Elsewhere in the world, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro was a no-show at a rally held in his honour. Hundreds gathered in the capital Caracas yesterday to demonstrate their support for the leader. The rally comes off the back of weekend drone blasts that the government is calling an assassination attempt on Maduro. The president's approval rating is hovering around 25%, with opponents blaming his policies for worsening an economic meltdown. In Italy, two people have been killed and over 60 injured after two vehicles collided near Bologna airport. Italian media say a lorry carrying cars crashed on a bridge with another tanker truck containing inflammable materials. The accident caused an explosion, sending a huge ball of fire and smoke into the sky. Emergency crews in California are battling what's become the largest wildfire in the state's history. The Mendocino complex has grown to cover more than 280,000 acres and is continuing to spread. The fire has already destroyed 75 homes and forced thousands to flee. Some environmental researchers say the recent wave of wildfires and droughts indicate the world is at risk of entering hothouse conditions. A scientific study says that the global warming target reached at the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement may not stop a domino effect from moving the Earth well beyond it and into catastrophic scenarios. Matthew Larotonda has the details. A new study says that the global warming target set at the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement may be too little to stop catastrophic temperature rises. The goal of the accord is to keep the world's average temperature from rising two degrees Celsius above what it was before the Industrial Revolution. Even two degrees comes with its own dangers, but is widely considered a tipping point for the planet. We're currently at one degree Celsius and rising. The latest study was conducted jointly by the Australian National University, University of Copenhagen and other institutes. It says that even if that goal was met, other processes that have already been worsened by climate change may carry the Earth up to four to five degrees higher. Processes such as melting polar ice and methane releasing from the seafloor. A rise of that magnitude would make new regions of the planet uninhabitable in time. And in the short term, scenes like the rare heat wave currently hitting Europe will become much more common, along with the disasters that accompany it. It may all be a moot point, though. The United Nations has previously warned the voluntary greenhouse gas reductions agreed in Paris may not be enough to reach the two-degree target anyway, even if governments kept to their pledges. Donald Trump pulled the United States out of it altogether. Let's switch gears now and get the latest sports news. Tennis first and Rafael Nadal will return to action in the Rogers Cup in Toronto this week. It'll be the Spaniard's first appearance since losing in the Wimbledon semi-finals as he steps up his preparations for the US Open. The world number one is the defending champion at Flushing Meadows, which takes place at the end of the month. 
In the meantime, Nadal faces a tough return to the hard courts with unpredictable Frenchman Benoit Paire, his opponent in the second round, and Stan Wawrinka or Nick Kyrgios' potential opposition in round three. It'll be a Rogers Cup without Roger Federer, though. The Swiss star withdrew from the event along with several big names, including Andy Murray and Serena Williams. Rafa, though, feels refreshed after a three-week break. Uh, after a, a great run in clay and grass, uh, I needed some period of time off, and that's what I did. Uh, of course, um, now is the moment to work hard again and uh, just try to be ready for the, for the action here. And that's what I'm doing these couple of days, working hard and just trying to, to be ready. New Barcelona signing Arturo Vidal says he wants to win everything whilst he's at the club, especially the Champions League. The 31-year-old midfielder joined the La Liga champions from Bayern Munich for a reported fee of up to $24 million. Vidal won Serie A with Juventus four times between 2012 and 2015 and lifted the Bundesliga trophy in each of his three seasons at Bayern, but has never won the European Cup. Bas Barcelona last won the Champions League in 2015, beating Vidal's Juventus in the final, and rivals Real Madrid have won it in each of the three seasons since. In surfing, American Courtney Conalogue has made a triumphant comeback from injury to win the U.S. Open on her home beach. The Californian produced a dogged performance in the seventh round of the World Surf League, beating Australia's overall championship tour leader Stephanie Gilmore. Conalogue finished fourth in the, in the WSL standings in 2017, but has slipped out of the top ten after missing the first four WSL events this season with an ankle injury. Her win moved her up to 15th place. Meanwhile, Gilmore, with three wins already this season, stretched her lead at the top after American rival Lakey Peterson finished fifth on Sunday. That's it for now. Join us again later tonight at 11.30 for an update on the stories that are shaping your world. I'm Hailing Chan and this is VUE TV News. Goodbye.